You're listening to Trailblazers.fm, an interview-styled podcast that delves deep into bold conversations with successful Black entrepreneurs and leaders. Join us weekly to learn actionable strategies, valuable tactics, and innovative tools that you can put to use immediately on your journey to blazing your trail. And now, here's your host, my husband, Stephen A. Hart. Hello and happy Friday to you. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. My name is Stephen A. Hart. I'm the host of the Trailblazers.fm podcast and platform. And if this is your first time checking us out, I just want to say thank you so much for joining our live stream today. If you've been part of our Blazing Nation community for a while, just want to say big ups as always. We appreciate your support as we continue to explore these stories of successful Black leaders and entrepreneurs. Uh, we hope to impart the know-how, the confidence, and that motivational mission fuel that you need to blaze your trail. So one more thing, if you haven't yet done so, don't forget to like this video, subscribe and share this video right now. We believe that someone listening to these episodes, whether now or at some future point, are going to be impacted uh, by the content shared here today. So today, our guest is Stephen Bailey. Stephen is the founder and CEO of Exec Online. It's a leading provider of B2B leadership development solutions through partnerships with the world's top business schools. This is an amazing brother. He's smart, graduated Phi Beta Kappa and summa cum laude uh, from Emory University and holds a JD from Yale Law School. So listen, before I bring Stephen in, I just want to say good morning. I'm seeing so much love in the room. Good morning, Annette. Good morning, Ken. I, I see Stacy here. Craig, you're here. Jamila. Uh, listen, Ralston, I'm just loving it, man. Thank you so much for rocking with us. Give a, a virtual welcome and join me in 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 welcoming Stephen. So we're having a a double dose of Stevens this morning. Good morning, Stephen. Actually, I I Let's think see. I still have yeah. you today. There we go. <laughs> I don't know if it was me or you, but uh, but yeah. from one Stephen to another, a pleasure to be here. Really looking forward to the conversation. Absolutely. Absolutely. So Stephen, we start all our conversations off on trailblazers from a place of gratitude. And so the first thing I wanted to ask you is what's an unexpected blessing that you're most grateful for in your life right now? Yeah. Um, you know, I, I think one of the, I, I've had many, uh, and I think, you know, I, I have a great family. Um, I, I had a great upbringing, uh, you know, really set the table for, um, everything I've been able to accomplish. Uh, so I always start there. Um, but I would say that, you know, uh, just being introduced to entrepreneurship when I wasn't expecting it was, um, I think, a real blessing that's kind of fueled my career. So when I was in law school, I assumed I was going to be a lawyer. Um, I, uh, you know, went to a couple of law firms uh, over the summers and, and tried it out and wasn't passionate about it, but I didn't really have an alternative path. And I was fortunate enough to be introduced to a law school classmate serendipitously um, who had started a company before law school. Uh, and we sat down and had lunch and he talked to me about entrepreneurship and what it really meant. Um, and I got really excited and kind of bit by the entrepreneurship bug. You know, I went to a law firm uh, right after law school. Always in the back of my mind, I was thinking, when is the moment when I can, you know, really uh, think about being an entrepreneur? And I think as a, particularly as black entrepreneurs, I think there are a lot of stories like that. Often we are the first generation entrepreneurs in our families. Um, yeah. And um, we're not always exposed early to that world of possibilities. So that was really fortunate for me. Awesome. So we're going to get into some of that and that entre leadership uh, gene, if you will, that um, has has been, um, you know, flowing through you over over these years. But I want to take you back for just a second, Stephen. I, I love to understand a bit more about our guest's story, right? So. 
I know you went to Emory. I don't know your background. Are you from Georgia originally? I'm actually originally from New Orleans, uh, Louisiana, New Orleans. Uh, born and raised. Actually, um, uh, I think this podcast will be published after the surprise, or I, you know, sort of by, for others that aren't on today. But I'm surprising my mom for her for her birthday. So I'm actually heading down um, to New Orleans uh, tomorrow, actually, uh, and try to make it home as much as possible. It's obviously been difficult with COVID. We're really excited about that. But yeah, that's where I was born and raised and then made my way up the, the East Coast. Uh, my next stop was Atlanta for college. Nice. Emery, so how long did you stay in Atlanta? I was in Atlanta for four years. So I, I yeah. left right after um, college to go to law school. So uh, my next Got stop was, uh, was New Haven. And that was very different than Atlanta and very different than New Orleans. When you think about growing up in New Orleans, what, what comes to mind? other than amazing food and amazing music. Uh, you know, most people, are, you know, I think what's interesting about being from New Orleans is there are certain cities where you're from that city and people associate it with something that's actually very different than how you think about it if you're a local. So the first thing anyone thinks of when you think of New Orleans is French Quarter, right? Bourbon Street. Uh, and, you know, when, you, when you're growing up and living in New Orleans, you're not there very often. And so it's a, it's a really vibrant community. Um, amazing food, amazing music, probably the closest, you know, I know you have Caribbean roots I and mean, probably the closest to the Caribbean in the U.S. Um, um, but I, I'd say more than, than those things, probably most importantly, just the people. I mean, when you, when you arrive in New Orleans, you're immediately greeted with warmth. People on the street say hello that have never met you before. That's something I actually had to unlearn when I moved up to the East Coast, because whenever I'd say hi to people, um, <laughs> you know, randomly, they'd be like, oh, this guy must be crazy. So, uh, but that's what I really miss about being back home. You know, that's a part of my Caribbean gene uh, that I'm teaching these two kids right now. You know, I drop them off in the morning. I'm like, you better say good morning to everybody. I don't care if they don't respond. <laughs> but um, yeah, <laughs> that kind of hospitality will will carry forward in in the in in the work world, right? Um, and I'm sure it has for you. Um, today, you're you're the founder, so I, I bring us forward. Um, you're the founder and CEO of Exec Online. Tell us a little bit about the platform. Um, I know you shared a little bit um, in in the intro here, but tell us about you know what what sparked the idea for Exec Online. Yeah, you know, um, it, you know, the thing about ideas on that, it's hard to ever like you know. A lot of times you tell a story and it's like this one moment, and you yeah. know, at all, you know, it's all there. But but usually it's a series of experiences that you have. Um, and they come together maybe in a moment into a coherent idea. But for me, there were a couple of, uh, of, of themes. So one, um, you know, I uh, was the CEO of a company previously um, named Frontier Strategy Group. I uh, worked with uh, organizations, typically large Fortune 1000 companies in emerging markets. Mm -hmm. So a lot of uh, exposure to international markets and leaders. And so I had some sense of the problems that organizations faced when it came to training and developing their leaders when they were global in nature. So that was a one piece. Uh, the other piece was as a black entrepreneur, I also experienced a lot of being the only person in the room, particularly in leadership conversations, whether it was raising capital. And I think in my entire career raising capital, I've met three black partners uh, that, that, that are actually at venture capital firms. Uh, and that's over a decade of time i also when i traveled around the world to these different cities we host events for our clients very few black people in the room very few minorities in the room generally very few women in the room and so the other passion that kind of combined with that was could we create a world in which we allowed more democratized access to leadership mobility in organizations so rather than these really blue ship institutions only being available to the few. You had to be tapped on the shoulder to go to Stanford or Wharton or Columbia for any of their executive certificate programs. Could we bring that online and democratize access so that more people like you and I would get access to those types of, of programs? So it was really that those two experiences coming together, actually on a walk in Harlem, uh, which is where I'm, I'm joining from today and where my wife and I live, uh, that was sort of the light bulb of maybe there's something here. So what do you compare um, the programs that you, so versus, is this purely focused at uh, people of color? 
It's not. So it's it's broadly focused for all leaders. Mm. And what it's not are MBAs. So these are not multi-year commitments where you get a degree from one of these schools. These are short form, uh, would have traditionally been called executive education programs that might mm. range anywhere in our portfolio from one week to six weeks. And at the end, you get a certificate from that school in that mm. area of focus. So it could be strategy, innovation, finance. And our view was, if you, if you look at a lot of programs that are targeted just toward uh, minority leaders, they're focused on what does it mean to be a minority in an organization? And that's important. Uh, but if I want to advance to the highest levels of leadership as a minority leader, I still need the same skills and training around strategy, innovation and finance and all these areas that are going to be important to development. And so our view was if you could make it available to everyone, absolutely, that you remove that unconscious bias that typically exists in organizations where people who get tapped for the best opportunities often look like the people who are tapping them. Mm. It removes some of it. <laughs> some of it, exactly, exactly. There's so, no, there's no sort of bullet for sure. We're, yeah, yeah. That, that's no doubt. So, you know, you, you touched on that, right? Um, and I, I'm thinking back to you saying, hey, you know, prior to this, you were, you were a, a, a CEO. Uh, was was your Yale law degree kind of that that um, foot in the door, if you will, um, for you being one of the few in the room? Would would you kind of you know say hey beyond obviously it probably was a big foot in the door? Um, was education kind of that capital that wealth um, that you noticed uh, was what kind of helped the few? of of us um kind of get to that point absolutely absolutely and i would say there's no doubt that yeah was a foot in the door um i always say about entrepreneurship that you'll have true equality in how capital is allocated to entrepreneurs of color to women not when someone like myself is able to start a company but when there's the 21 year old in a hoodie who has a great idea who gets funded by one of these large venture capital firms which happens all the time for young white founders uh typically yeah. male but doesn't happen a lot for black female founders right or black male founders um and so uh, there's no doubt yeah was a foot in the door um i'd say the network was also particularly important so it's not just what you learned it's the fact that i was having lunch with someone who started a company before uh they before they went to law school and that network ends up in a lot of cases being, in my view, um, the key nut to crack, so to speak, uh, in terms of providing more access to the world of entrepreneurship, particularly to what I would call the institutional world of entrepreneurship, yeah. where you're talking about big money behind entrepreneurs that have great ideas. Mm -hmm. And Stephen, while we were preparing for this, um you'd shared the following. You said black entrepreneurs have the power to make real impact, impactful changes in our society when it comes to societal and workplace equity issues. We must confront it together, fix it together and move forward together. Could you expand on that thought? Absolutely. So I'll say two things. I think one, um, there's often a bias in uh, the, the way a lot of institutions think about black entrepreneurship or you know, female entrepreneurship, where we get pigeonholed in, you know, sort of black, or like on black issues, right? So mm -hmm. uh, or female issues. Uh, and so a typical pitch would be, oh, Stephen would be great to launch a product for the black community because he understands the unique needs of that population. And it's often a consumer product. I think that, you know, we, I, I'm one of the few black entrepreneurs in the, in the B2B space that, that have been, you know, venture backed um, by capital. Um, and what I find is the next step is to help the broader set of constituents understand that our perspective, our intelligence, our capabilities can be applied to any context, not just mm. context text in which, uh, you know, there might be a, a perception of a need for black perspective. And so I think the more that we as entrepreneurs are really pushing ourselves to, to enter every area of entrepreneurship, 
not yeah. just areas that we're pushed into, because that's where you'll be guided. Oh yeah, you should do something in this area. But I think we've got a bigger opportunity to say, whether it's enterprise software technology or consumer product or anything else in between, we have a role to play uh, and we've got a lot of talent to bring uh, to this market. It's funny, as you said that, um, I, I'm, I'm working with a, a, a good friend um, right now who's, who has always tried to avoid that pigeonhole um, and is now having conversation with a, a big client um, and just that, right? Um, you, your product fits well within the black community and it was never designed just for and is having to you know explain and work his way out of that when he never you know never intended for that to be the case anyway so we're having to frame the marketing in a way that uh, you know makes that even more clear in the imaging and and the messaging yeah and it goes well. back to the, oh sorry i didn't interrupt go ahead no you're good um i was gonna say it goes back to the earlier point that we we're discussing about our uh, programs, for example, where we didn't want to make this about just this is available for uh, minority of black entrepreneurs or minority of black leaders and organizations and in, in the case of our clients, because ultimately organizations often pigeonhole those groups as well. So they set those groups up, but then the opportunities that flow from it, how you're perceived in the organization, how you progress to the organization uh, is different. Than, than what is provided to everyone else. And so our view is if you give uh, minority uh, leaders, black leaders access to the very best leadership development in line with their other peers, they'll rise to the top. Um, and, and, and so that's something that was really important to us to think about it more broadly than just this is a, a set of programs for black leaders. And is that education or, or those skills and talents that are taught, is that what lends to the, the confidence and as, as you touched on the courageousness uh, to, to not be, you know, to be able to make the kind of decisions and take a stand, right? Um, to move yourself in the direction that you want to go versus where you're being pushed. Yeah. So, you know, when we think about democratizing access, it has a few components. So the first piece is how you actually gain the approval to go to a program at Stanford or Wharton or whatever it might be. And so traditionally, you've had to go ask your boss or ask your boss's boss if it's okay and get an approval to travel and company might pay upwards of $20,000 for you to go somewhere for a week on campus in any of these schools. And one of the things we wanted to do was empower um, leaders to take control of their own development. Uh, mm -hmm. And so what that means is, you know, in our, with our solution, we've got um, access to all of our different business schools for one fixed fee at the company level so that then individuals can just sign up when they want. So it goes from the days of being tapped on the shoulder, you know, in that, you know, kind of room where it happens, so to speak, to just being able to pull out your phone and decide, I want to advance my career. I want to get a certificate from Stanford and I can start that and do that anytime I want. So that was one key piece was removing all those approvals and giving confidence to black leaders and other leaders that they can take control of their own development. And then I think once in these programs, the other thing that was really important to us was not just to make it a learning experience, but to also make it an opportunity for corporate visibility. So we build projects into all of our programs um, that often end up getting presented to your boss or to senior leadership in the organization that are kind of stretch assignments for you. And often that's the hardest thing, particularly for a minority leader to get access to are those like coveted stretch assignments. And so by building that into our programs, allowing leaders to stretch themselves as they learn, and then show the organization, I've got this set of capabilities that have prepared me for the next level of advancement uh, to us was another key piece of the puzzle. Wow. So kind of pulling back to you, Stephen, um, this sounds amazing. And, you know, I, I commend you. I, I saw, you know, metrics when, when Kathy and I first spoke that, you know, you've raised tens of millions of dollars and you touched on the venture capital uh, you know, being, being one of the few to raise, um, you, I'm sure you've come a long way through a great many failures, right. In, in building exec online. Um, and I, I find, you know, it's, it's 
for the entrepreneur um, in our community, um, we learn quite a bit from not just the successes, but the failures. Um, is there is there any any of the many <laughs> that come to mind um, that, you know, probably had you ugly cry, right? <laughs> um, you know, what was the lesson? Talk to us about that, you know, a, a failure um, and, and the lesson learned through that. Yeah, so I think the early days of entrepreneurship are defined by so many micro failures that it's hard to just pinpoint one. So for example, when you're going out and raising capital, you might you might speak to 50, 100 different uh, potential investors to get to one or two that are interested. And I think you know every meeting is often you know you know going into the meeting that there's a ninety percent chance or more that you're going to leave with that investor saying, "Oh, that's interesting, but we're not interested." And so. Part of it, and, and that's also early days when you're pitching customers or pitching business schools, you're getting a lot of no's. Mm. And I think one of the hardest things for entrepreneurs to figure out is when the no's you're getting are just because that's the nature of the game. And when the no's you're getting are because you, you, there's, some, there's an issue with your idea. Mm. Uh, and so, you know, it's, the, it's that balance of you want to be confident. You want to take, you want to step into a meeting and always be able to put your best foot forward and really believe. Because if you don't believe in what you're doing, there's no way you're going to sell anyone else. So you have to mm. believe in it. But how do you believe in it when people just keep telling you no? Uh, and if people keep telling you no long enough, is it actually a good idea? Because you also don't want to necessarily pursue something right that that isn't a great idea. And so, for me, one of the things that was really helpful before I started uh, raising capital, before I started um, uh, speaking to potential customers, it was speaking to people in my network that I thought had some area, an interesting perspective on, on the issue that I was pursuing and not asking them for anything. I wasn't asking them for money. I wasn't asking them to be a customer. I was just asking them for unvarnished advice. Give it to me straight. You're not going to hurt my feelings. And after enough of those conversations, I realized, no, this is a great idea, mm. but I'm just going to have to get through a lot of no in order to find the folks that really understand the vision and what we're trying to accomplish. And so that's my biggest piece of advice is, you know, get to conviction by asking people to tell you the truth when you're not asking them for anything, uh, because then they will tell you the truth. And then once you have that conviction, stay through a lot of those no's uh, in order to get to yes. That's a gem right there, because um, it's it's easier heard than applied, right? Um, we we hear that quite often, um, but it's you know until you get into sales and until you get comfortable hearing no and and able to 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 let that roll off your back and and keep making that pitch, um, it's not easy by any measure. Uh, with with building this and, and raising, were you, I, I, I think of the different pieces, right? Um, you're, you're building relationship to be able to deliver, uh, to, to be able to deliver this training. Um, you have these B2B relationships are, were you able to, of course you heard a whole bunch of no's. Did you have to get to some yeses before you were able to raise and have that proof? Or were you able to raise, you know, which came first? Yeah, so I've always said this to, to young entrepreneurs, people who are thinking about entrepreneurship. Every great entrepreneurial story starts with the ability to solve a very difficult chicken egg problem. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and so in our case, if you think about what we do, we work with top business schools. Yeah. We partner with them to take their programs online. And then we sell those programs that we partner with them on to companies. So the big chicken egg problem that immediately presents itself is who comes first, the school yeah, or the, the school? or the you know or the company, right? That's what I'm uh, thinking about. <laughs> yeah. And uh, you know, Stephen, I'm going to tell you the short version, but I, I'll say right, you know, you know these versions, you know, these stories after the fact always make you seem like, oh yeah, you figured it out, you were such a genius. It was a lot of trial and error, and we wow. we were wrong a lot. We started, you know, we had a lot of uh, stops and starts trying to figure out this chicken egg problem. But ultimately where we landed was that you were more likely to get companies to move first mm. if you positioned what 
uh, you were doing it in the right way. So what we said to them was not spend a lot of money buying this thing you haven't seen yet. Uh, what we said was we used the fact that we didn't have any to our advantage. So we said, why don't you co-create this with us? And if you look at the data and the research on, on people, because when you're selling these early things, you're selling the people. You think you're selling the large companies, but you're really selling that individual yeah. in an organization that says, I want to take a, a bet here. And if you look at the data on people, about 20% of people are early adopters. They want opportunities like this to help you create something cool. And they're in their day job and they go home every day and they might be bored. And they like that day where they can come home and talk to their wife or their kids about something really interesting they heard about at work. And so we want it to be that really interesting thing. And so we talked to about a hundred different companies and there's no substitute for, you know, at this point it was me and a, a couple of, of co-founders. Um, we talked to um, about a hundred organizations. And what do you know about 15 of them? So close to that 20% said, we'll co-create this with you. But the way we did it was to make it super low risk. We said, look, don't pay us now. At that point, we'd raise just a little bit of, of money. We said, we're gonna, build, we're gonna build this with you over a series of months. And if at the end we deliver it on time within what we've outlined, then you're in, right? Then you're committed. But if we don't deliver, you can walk away and you know you just have to sign something saying you wanna do this, but you can put that contract in your desk and make out it ever exists if we don't deliver. And that's what got companies but particularly individuals in those companies excited to say, let's co-create this. It's clear you're not just looking for money. You're looking for a true partner and we built it together. But how long did that take, Stephen? I mean, were you going pretty much? I mean, it's it's easy to say, oh, don't pay us right now, but I'm sure you're like strapped for cash, right? And and having to develop and having to do all this. Um, was, was there a period, you know, how long before from from idea to the point where you were profitable? So um, for us, I, I, and this I think is a, a real issue uh, when we come back to institutional support for black entrepreneurs. The, as you think about really big ideas and you think about how to launch them in the right way, it takes time and it takes money. And mm -hmm. often because black entrepreneurs are undercapitalized, don't have access to those networks, you've got to bootstrap Right, before you should really be bootstrapping, when you really should be thinking about how do I build the right long-term relationships? How do I really set the table for what was a, you know, sort of a business, in, you know, a successful business in the future? And so for us, just to give you a sense, we had those initial conversations with companies. The first conversation started in February uh, of 2013, and we launched our first product in uh, October, right, late wow. October of 2013. And we'd raised about $750,000 of seed capital. Uh, Kaplan Ventures um, was our initial seed investor. I've uh, been a great partner, still a member yeah. of our board today. Um, and then uh, we raised about another million once we'd started to show that these companies were interested to help start to build the solution. So it was about a million seven five to get us from beginning, right, which yeah. was late 2012, to pitching companies in early 2013, to then launching in late 2013. And then wow. from there, our journey was, you know, we we're sort of off and running. Um, and we just had, you know, a lot of, a, a lot of early momentum and success. But without that early capital, it would have been really challenging. Yeah. What do you think, I'm talking about capital, I'm actually having a conversation um, for those listening in. We're having a conversation about crowdfunding um, next week. Uh, and um, are you familiar with that source of, of raising, um, you know, thoughts on alternate sources of raising? Because we know we have a, pr a problem right now with black entrepreneurs, especially black women being able to raise equal sums, um, you know, as, as our white counterpart. Um, are you familiar? Are you an advocate of crowdfunding and, and other alternate sources of, of being able to raise capital? Yeah, so I think we have to contemplate alternate sources. Um, but I also don't think we can let major institutions off the hook, so to speak. Um, because, you know, mm -hmm. since the murder of George Floyd, all you've heard about is, you know, you've heard announcements all the time. These funds are going to you know invest in um, entrepreneurs of color and, and female entrepreneurs. And the early data suggests that's not happening. 
So, mm. you know, in the last year or so, if you look at the billions and billions and billions of dollars of capital that's, that have flowed to entrepreneurs, it's been a great time to raise money for, for great ideas. Less than 1% of that. I think it's about two thirds of 1% is flowing to entrepreneurs of color. And so we have a real challenge there that we've got to solve. As I mentioned, part of the network challenge, how do you get black entrepreneurs, other minority entrepreneurs uh, into those networks? Um, and I think alternative funding sources are a way to create different networks and different opportunities and different avenues. So I'm all for that. But what I wouldn't want to happen is to say, okay, great, we've got these alternate funding sources. And so we're letting the largest institutions off the hook because the, the, the size of the capital that they can provide is just different in kind than our crowdsourcing, you know, sort of uh, platform or other alternate platforms. Those are the institutions that can really fund the massive ideas um, that change the world. And we've got a lot of, as a community, a lot of massive ideas to share if we have the right capital system. Yeah. Steven, I, I, I feel like you and I will need to have a part two, man. I, I'm loving this conversation. Um, thank you so much for taking the time this, this Friday morning to, to rock with us. Before I let you go, our Blazing Nation loves to hear the resources of our featured guests. And so I was curious, you know, what books are you reading or have you read recently that you think we should add to our reading queue? Yeah, great question. So, um, you know, I'm a big, I, I've become a big uh, believer in behavioral uh, science, particularly like brain science and how we make decisions. Um, and uh, I think that area has really helped me improve uh, as a leader. Uh, and, you know, particularly because I think as you move into more senior levels of leadership, you're thinking about how do you inspire and lead people? One of the, the key things you understand is people process information in a very specific way. And it's actually more predictable than you might think. And how you position, how you present, how you show up makes a huge difference in terms of how people take in what you're doing. And so the book that got me started on that journey um, was uh, Thinking Fast and Slow uh, by Daniel Kahneman. Uh, and it's about uh, brain science, and in particular, the two parts of your brain, brain, the part of your brain that processes decisions really quickly, uh, and frankly, without a lot of contemplation. So you're crossing the street, a car is coming, what do you do? Get out of the way. That's that, that, that part of the brain. Uh, and yeah. then there's the part of the brain that is um, that really uh, contemplates deep uh, thoughts, right, around, um, uh, you know, issues like I'm starting a company and what are all the different you know, kind of considerations I need to take into account and, and how you understand information process to through those two parts of the brain makes a big difference in terms of how you tackle things like bias, for example, right, which tend to be knee jerk reactions to people based on, you know, initial identity and those sorts of things. Good stuff. How can our, our listeners and, and viewers hanging with us here, how can they stay connected with you beyond today's conversation? I, from a video standpoint, I've been sharing uh, your your links here, but tell those listeners uh, how, how they can connect. Best way to connect with me is always through LinkedIn. Uh, so uh, I, um, I'm on LinkedIn um, and you know shoot me a message, reach out to connect, would love to hear I'm always inspired myself by people's entrepreneurial journeys and, and what they're trying to accomplish, particularly black entrepreneurs. And so we'd love to love to hear what, what we're all up to. Good stuff. Stephen, my last question for you today. What's one action that our Blaze Nation should take coming away from this conversation that's going to help them to blaze their trail? Think about your passion. Uh, the beauty of entrepreneurship is that you can start a company doing anything uh, that you want. And that's what's so empowering about it, why it's so important. And so if you're going to start anything you want, make sure it's something you're passionate about. And the money will follow, but the passion is what really makes you great. Fantastic. Stephen, I appreciate you, man. Thank you so very much. Hang, hang with me here for a second. Um, hey, listen, Blazing Nation, thank you so much for, for hanging with us today. Uh, make sure you stay connected with Stephen. And I will see you next Friday. Thanks for spending time with us today. If we aren't yet connected, let's keep the conversation going on LinkedIn, Twitter, and Instagram. 
Now, we grow when you subscribe, share, and invite others to check us out. We believe that others who consume these stories will be moved to make significant changes that have generational impact for many others, both now and well into the future. Blaze Nation, go out today and keep 